Hello, and welcome to A Flight Over the Cloud Native Landscape. My name is Carson Anderson. I work for Weave. Not that Weave, not the one you're thinking, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Carson underscore ops and on GitHub at Carsonoid. I actually have the distinct honor of having more followers on GitHub than on Twitter. So feel free to follow me on one or both of those platforms if you want to see what I'm doing. In fact, every presentation I've ever made, all the artwork for this presentation and my others is always open source on GitHub. So follow me there. Now, before I go any further, I want to say what I mean. When I said not that weave, the weave that I work for is not the cloud native vendor you might be thinking about. My weave is an end user company. And if you're curious about what we do, you can find us on getweave.com. I'm saying this because I want you to know that I'm going to teach you about a lot of different projects and I want you to know we have no stake. I have no personal professional stake in any of these projects. Um, so you're not getting any sort of specific vendor pitch here. Now what I want to do in this presentation is cover the 12 graduated and 21 incubating projects in the CNCF. That's 33 projects total and I have less than 35 minutes to teach them all to you. Now, I'm not going to obviously in that amount of time be able to teach you everything about a project or cover all the features or nuances of any given project, but I want you to leave this presentation having a base understanding of what these projects do and how they relate to each other and know which ones you're curious about and might want to learn more about or might want to use yourself. So before we go further, let's say a big thanks to Fippy.io for these characters. I'm going to use them pretty liberally in the presentation because I find them to be a lot more interesting and fun than just having boxes called app one and app two. So you're going to see, see these characters show up quite a bit. Specifically, you're going to see Fippy. And when you see Fippy, it's ref I'm going to refer to a legacy application written in an unspecified language. So it could be any language. And when you see Goldie, it's specifically a newer application written in Go. Before we go into the uh, projects themselves, let's talk about what it means to be graduated in the CNCF. So if I've got a project and that project wants to be a graduated project, you have to pass a few things first. You have to be receiving constant contribution from at least two different organizations into the project. That, that means that you know that if you're going to use a project that's graduated, you're not dependent on one organization to maintain the project. You also have to certify that you're passing the best practices for core infrastructure and fully open source software. You have to pass a security audit, publish some metadata around who governs the project, who's in charge of the code, and who's using the project. Once you do that, you pass a super majority vote from the CNCF, and you've become a graduated project. Now, notice that never in that did I talk about something being quote unquote production ready. Graduated status in the CNCF, uh, you don't have to be graduated to be production ready. There are plenty of incubating and even sandbox projects that might be production ready for you depending on what you're trying to get. So don't be afraid to use the projects that are incubating or sandbox. Although it is great to be a graduated project, it's not necessarily just a measure of production readiness, but rather a measure of openness and transparency. Now let's go ahead and dig into all these projects because I have a lot to cover. The first one I want to talk about is Container D. It's a daemon, like you might expect from the D, meaning it's a process that runs on your systems to help you manage containers. So you can use Container D directly in your code to build container images and to manage containers. Uh, but most of us won't use Container D directly. Most of us will use Container D as part of something like Docker or another project. So when most of us build a container image today and we do that with Docker, we're doing it with Container D. So if, in fact, this project is so useful that it's actually built into a lot of the public cloud Kubernetes offerings and the K3S project, which is in sandbox state, that allows you to run a full or mostly full featured Kubernetes cluster uh, all in one binary. And that does that using Container D. So if you're curious about low-level container operations, check out Container D. Next is Tough. Tough stands for the Update Framework, and it's all about dealing with managing updates. So Tough is a series of standards and tools that we can build into our code and use to deal with updates. I'm being intentionally vague here because the Tough standards don't prescribe to any one specific kind of update you might be. They might be package updates or image updates, but anything that you might want to get regular updates from and verify the source of. So that's tough. I won't cover it much because most of us won't use tough. We're going to use the reference implementation of tough or the main implementation of tough in Notary. Now, Notary takes all the tough ideas, but it builds us some actual tools that most of us can use rather than writing our own code to deal with update management and verification. And most of us will probably use Notary as part of image signing and verification to ensure that when we get an image, we get it from somebody that we trust and it hasn't been modified along the way so that when we pull images, when we pull code into our infrastructure, we know that we can trust where it came from. So that's Notary. Again, Tough and Notary have this tight relationship where Tough is the standards and Notary is an implementation of it, but uh, you should look into both of those if you're curious about that. 
Next is Harbor. Harbor is a private image registry, and it has all the features you might expect from a private image registry. You can upload OCI compliant images and get things like validation through something like Notary or even image inspection or vulnerability scanning, and along with a bunch of other features like you might expect from a private registry. It also has a really cool feature in that it can be a pull through cache. So you can run Harbor in your infrastructure, hook it up to public image registries, and then have your clients point to Harbor. And when they need an image, if that image exists in a public registry, Harbor will pull it through, cache it locally, allowing your clients to pull from Harbor instead of always going over the internet. So if you need to reduce your overall image pull bandwidth, you might check out Harbor for that. But either way, if you're curious about having a private image registry, check out Harbor. Next is Kubernetes. Of course, we can't talk cloud native without talking Kubernetes. Kubernetes was the first CNCF member project to reach the graduated status. Uh, and it is at its core container orchestration engine. So when I say that, I mean, we've got a suite of backend machines in Kubernetes, we call these nodes, and we want to run workloads on those nodes. And we can tell Kubernetes, hey, I want you to run a workload. Here's what it should look like. And Kubernetes will put that workload somewhere. We can then, of course, scale up, run multiple copies of our workload. In fact, Kubernetes can handle tons and tons of different workloads with different configuration. And because it's an orchestrator, it has things like automatic uh, dealing with things like nodes going down. So if a node goes down, Kubernetes sees that and can redistribute the declared workload, or it can automatically scale up and distribute workloads. It really lets us stop worrying about nodes. In fact, most of the time when we talk Kubernetes, we don't even talk nodes at all. We just think of our Kubernetes cluster as a whole cohesive unit, and we run our workloads in Kubernetes, and it deals with the underlying infrastructure for us. And of course, I have to bring in Captain Cube here because they're amazing, and why wouldn't you talk about Captain Cube when you get a chance? Uh, Kubernetes is really kind of the heart of a lot of other things that I'm going to talk about, and it, it is that way because it provides a lot of touch points, a lot of integration points for other systems to build upon Kubernetes to provide more value using Kubernetes as a core. So Kubernetes has the ability to add storage or networking layers, and it can add custom resources, which we'll talk about in a second, or even extend brand new APIs into the Kubernetes API ecosystem. So really, Kubernetes is the heart of cloud native in a lot of ways. Now, you don't have to run Kubernetes to be cloud native, but a lot of us do. Speaking of Kubernetes, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. So Helm is something we do actually have to run in Kubernetes because it's specifically around creating and maintaining applications in Kubernetes. So we know that we can run our workloads in Kubernetes and we call those pods, but it turns out there's actually a lot of things in Kubernetes that we could create. We can create configuration or services or different routing information to all help tell Kubernetes what our application looks like, to describe our application to Kubernetes. Helm allows us to take all that configuration, put it into one thing called a Helm chart. And that chart is sort of like a package that says, here's what my application looks like. Here's all the things you need to make and how they relate to each other. We send that to Helm, and Helm creates it in our Kubernetes cluster like we expect. The great thing about Helm and a Helm chart is it's this kind of recipe, this redistributable thing. We can take our chart and not only use it internally, but give that chart to other users or distribute that chart out into the world to help other users install our applications into their Kubernetes clusters. So you'll very often see a lot of the things I'm going to talk about be installable into your clusters using something like Helm. Another way that you might manage your applications in Kubernetes is using something like Argo. Argo is also an application manager, but it takes a different tact than Helm. Argo is a GitOps-based system for Kubernetes application management, meaning that we set up one or more Git repositories, and in those repositories, we describe what we want our application to look like in Kubernetes. We then hook Argo up between the repositories and our Kubernetes cluster or clusters, and it takes the described application and makes it true in Kubernetes. And it's doing GitOps, so it's always watching the repository, and as the repository changes, it syncs those changes into Kubernetes as they happen. And it allows us to take all the GitOps tools we know and love and use them to manage our Kubernetes applications. So if you're interested in GitOps and Kubernetes, check out Argo. I will also say that Argo, you don't have to just use Argo or just use Helm. Argo actually knows how to leverage Helm and customize and some other Kubernetes deployment mechanisms. That means they're not mutually exclusive. You can use Argo and Helm together. It's absolutely fine. One other way we might manage applications or the other applications may create for us to manage them is something called an operator. And the operator framework is a set of tools and libraries that help us build operators. Now my 30 second, what is an operator talk? So an operator can be thought of as an engine. It's a process we run inside our Kubernetes cluster that knows how to create applications for us. And we create something in Kubernetes called a custom resource. And that custom resource describes just the minimum amount of configuration that would need to exist to describe our application. And the engine we've written called an operator knows how to take that resource and make 
the application in Kubernetes force based on that resource. And then if we make a different resource with different configuration, the operator can operate on that and make that copy of the application. Really, the focus here is these CRDs. Rather than build a Helm chart or a Git repository, we actually put a resource into the Kubernetes API describing our application, and we use the operator framework or other tools to create an operator that knows how to take those custom resources and turn them into applications in our cluster. So if you're curious about a more advanced way to manage your applications throughout their entire life cycle inside Kubernetes, check out the operator framework. And just like before, the operators and Helm and Argo, those are not all mutually exclusive and a lot of them can work together very well. Next is Contour. Contour is sort of fills another gap in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So we talked about Kubernetes can run our workloads. It can also run these things called ingress. And ingress really is just a set of configuration. It's a set of configurations like host and path based information that says, hey, if you're coming in for this host and this path, go to this workload. But there's something missing. Ingress is just configuration. Something has to exist in the Kubernetes cluster to make that configuration real. Something has to run in the cluster, receive user traffic, read the ingress configuration and route to the right place based on that config. And that's what an, called an, is called an ingress controller in Kubernetes. And there are a lot of ingress controllers you can run in Kubernetes. Many of them are legacy web servers kind of jammed into this ingress controller role, but Contour is built from the ground up to be an ingress controller for Kubernetes. So if you're looking for a cloud native ingress controller or an ingress controller that's built specifically for this job and to try to do the right things for you right from the start, check out Contour. Next is Cube Edge. Cube Edge is interesting because it's orchestration built on Kubernetes. So we already know Kubernetes can do container orchestration, but Cube Edge is a platform that leverages the Kubernetes APIs and extension points to allow us to do edge compute management using the Kubernetes APIs. So if you're curious about doing edge management and managing your compute at the edge, and you wanna use the Kubernetes tools and, and API, check out Cube Edge. Next is Rook. Rook is also orchestration that runs in Kubernetes, but instead of managing other devices or containers, Rook is about managing storage inside Kubernetes. So Rook runs in Kubernetes and allows you to deal with block storage or object storage, and it can do things like provide persistent volumes for your workloads so that they can have a volume that follows them around in your cluster, or do other things like, like I said, object storage and other kinds of storage extensions that you would build on top of Kubernetes using Rook. So if you're curious about storage in Kubernetes, check out Rook. Next is CRIO or CRIO. CRI stands for Container Runtime Interface. It is kind of a layer that we describe that we define to help Kubernetes run containers. And O stands for OCI compliant. So every single node in our Kubernetes cluster runs this thing called a kubelet. And it's the kubelet's job to create and manage containers over their lifecycle on the node. But there's this kind of squishy blue layer I've drawn between the kubelet and actually doing things with containers. And that is where CRI, or the Container Runtime Interface, lives. And it is definitely where CRIO lives, because Cryo is a, uh, run a container runtime interface built specifically for Kubernetes to be simple and fast and efficient. So if you're curious about container runtime for Kubernetes built for Kubernetes, check out Cryo. Next is CNI. CNI stands for Container Network Interface. So we've got our workloads running on multiple nodes, and often they'll talk to each other over the network. Sometimes that's on the same node, but very often it's across nodes. And something needs to exist to kind of define and implement standards for how we set up networking between our workloads in a cluster or in the cloud. And that's what CNI seeks to do. It's a set of standards and tools and some kind of low-level helpers to help you build tools to deal with container to container networking in the cloud or in Kubernetes. So if you're interested in the low level operations of networks, check out CNI. Next is gRPC. So we've got our applications and they need to talk to each other. One way they might do that is over something like HTTP. It's been around for a long time. It's kind of a low level interrupt, but HTTP, although it's great, has its problems. Primarily, it's got a lot of overhead. Because it's connectionless and stateless, there's a lot of overhead in every single HTTP request to describe what's going on. Uh, gRPC exists as an alternative or can run alongside HTTP as another way for our applications to communicate with each other over a network. And this is stateful and has less overhead, so it can be a lot, lot faster than HTTP. gRPC also has cool things like bi-directional streaming, where applications can stream over a single connection both ways. Uh, if you leverage things like Proto, you can also get things like type safety using gRPC. So if you're looking to do application to application communication over the network and want to go above and beyond what you get from HTTP, check out gRPC. Next is Core DNS. Core DNS is like you might expect, a DNS server built for the cloud. So we've 
if we're all honest with each other, DNS is the oldest form of what we call service discovery, right? We ask for something by name, DNS gives us back where that lives. And even though we've got all of these cool new ways to do service discovery in the cloud, we still tend to be, tend to use DNS a lot. And Core DNS exists to be a brand new DNS server that is built for the cloud. And this picture that I'm showing you seems empty, seems like there's a lot missing. And that's because Core DNS really exists at the core of this big ecosystem of plugins. Core DNS has plugins for multiple ways to serve DNS traffic, whether that's the traditional UDP or new protocols like HTTP2 or gRPC. It also has the ability to bring in configuration and receive both initial configuration and constant active reconfiguration from multiple sources, including things like Kubernetes, etcd, which we'll talk about, or even public clouds, where Core DNS can privately serve the records that you define in your public cloud DNS systems. It also has plugins to help you do things like rewrites and tracing and metrics on your DNS, and it really brings DNS into the modern age. In fact, all these features make Core DNS the recommended and go-to DNS solution for doing DNS inside of Kubernetes, and it has been that way for quite a while now. So if you're curious about a modern DNS implementation, check out Core DNS. Now, before I talk about the next two projects, I want to briefly describe what a service mesh is. So we've got our applications, they're talking to each other, and if we want to add features to this network communication of our applications, features like end-to-end -end encryption, transparency, load balancing, traces, name any feature you want to add that's around networking. In the past, we've had to code that feature into every application, and we've had to ensure that all those applications support the same amount of features and their features work the same way and it can get very onerous and sometimes not just not be possible to change the code of a specific application a service mesh says well what if we write a proxy process and this proxy process can be thought of as living around our application although it technically lives just between the application and the and the network and that proxy is responsible for implementing the code to do all the things i just talked about transparency encryption that kind of thing well, once we've got all these proxies distributed and running in our ecosystem, we'll want a control plane that can manage these distributed proxies and give us a way to view what's happening with them and control them. You combine a proxy and a control plane and you get a service mesh. And you get powerful features like metrics, load balancing, encryption and transparency, and tracing all from the proxy without ever having to change your service code. And this is very, very powerful. And there are two projects I want to talk about that are part of a service mesh. The first one is Linkerd. Linkerd is a CNCF project that is a complete service mesh offering. So we've got our applications talking to each other. Linkerd comes with the Linkerd2 proxy, which is a proxy process written from the ground up for Linkerd to do this service mesh, to implement these service mesh ideas. It also comes with the Linkerd2 control plane that allows you to manage all the proxies. So it really is a full, complete end-to-end -end service mesh solution. Um, it's also very easy to get up and going and to use Linkerd. So if you're looking to implement a service mesh and you want to get up and going and want a complete solution, you can check out Linkerd. Another alternative for a service mesh is Envoy. Now Envoy is a bit different in that Envoy just focuses on being the proxy process for the service mesh. If you're asking where is the control plane, Envoy doesn't provide one, it doesn't prescribe one. It leaves that open to the implementer. And this seems like a downside. That blank spot may seem initially compared to Linkerd like it's a problem, but it's actually a great power. The fact that the Envoy proxy focus, project focuses entirely on being a service mesh proxy or just a service proxy means that it can really focus on that and provide the best possible proxy that you could need. And actually Envoy is the backing proxy between a lot of other cloud native projects. So if you're curious about just running a service proxy, check out Envoy. Next is open tracing. Like you might guess, it's all about dealing with traces. So we know that we can use something like a service mesh to get automatic tracing between app, our user request and the applications it bounces around. But if we wanna know what that user request does, in each application it visits, as it kind of goes from method to method and spends a different amount of time in each application doing different things, we need to instrument our application. We need to write code to create these tracing, these traces. And that's what open tracing exists to do. It, like you might have guessed from the name, open tracing is provider agnostic. So the great thing about it is you can instrument your applications. You can write code in your applications to generate trace data. And open tracing works with a multitude of providers, meaning that it, it doesn't care who you use. You instrument once and never have to do it again. One place you might export this trace data from open tracing or elsewhere is to Jaeger. Jaeger is a trace aggregation and trace management platform. So we've got our trace data that we've got from our service mesh or some, from something like open tracing. We need to take that data and send it somewhere so that we can aggregate it all and view it 
and manage it. And that's what Jaeger does. Jaeger provides a UI where you can dig into your traces and see exactly how they break down. It, you can search through your traces and it has other API extensions that lets Jaeger really be the core of tracing in your cloud native system. So that's Jaeger. If you're curious about somewhere to send your traces and view your traces in the cloud, check out Jaeger. Next is Prometheus. Prometheus is all about dealing with metrics in the cloud. Now, we know that we run applications all over the place, especially in the cloud, and those applications are generating data, right? They want to generate data around how many requests they're making, how many requests are succeeding and failing, that kind of stuff. Uh, what we used to do when we wanted application metrics was instrument our applications, put code in there that had the applications take those metrics and export them to a specific provider. And if we ever wanted to switch metrics providers, we couldn't do it because the applications would have to be retooled. Uh, Prometheus turns that on its head. Prometheus says, well, part of the Prometheus spec is saying, here's a standard way that you're all going to serve up metrics. You're going to just expose a web page and give me your metrics, and Prometheus is going to go to each application individually and pull that metric data down and aggregate it. Uh, and it knows where your applications live, because remember, we're in the cloud. Things are coming and going all the time. It knows where your applications are and how to find them by having cloud integrations or Kubernetes integrations so that as your applications come up and down and move, Prometheus always knows where to go to get that metric data. And it kind of flips the whole idea of metrics on its head. Once Prometheus has gone and scraped that metric data and pulled it in, it pulls it into its own internal time series database and can give you features like charting and alerts and metric searching and other API integrations that really sort of like Jaeger was with traces, it lets Prometheus be the core of metrics in the cloud. So if you're interested in an open source metric system, check out Prometheus. Now Thanos exists alongside and with Prometheus to solve some specific problems. It is very easy to get up and going with a single Prometheus instance in the cloud. No big deal, you can get up and going very quickly. But if you're going to run multiple Prometheus instances, and if they're going to be distributed across geographic regions, or you want fault tolerance, the Prometheus project isn't really focused on solving that right now, but the Thanos project is. You can think of Thanos as a wrapper around one or more Prometheus instances that allows you to aggregate data and go to Thanos and run a metrics query and have it go to all your Prometheus instances and run that query for you. Thanos also has the ability to take that data and export it into multiple cloud storage mechanisms so that you can have long-term Prometheus storage because Prometheus doesn't tend to want to keep data for very long. So if you're curious about distributed Prometheus, long-term metrics from Prometheus, check out Thanos. In that same vein, there's the Cortex project. Now, the Cortex project also exists to solve the multiple Prometheus problem, but it works a bit differently. It's designed to always pull all of the data. Rather than wrapping it, just ingests all the data from all your Prometheus instances and stores it in its own internal architecture. That way, when you query your metrics, you don't even have to go to your Prometheus instances. They just act as a data source, and really, Cortex is at the heart of your metrics at that point. So if you're interested in long-term aggregated Prometheus metrics, you can check out Cortex. Now, I know those two projects, Thanos and Cortex, seem very similar, and that's because they are. You'll have to do your own research to find out which of these two projects might be the right one for you. Next is FluentD. Now, FluentD is all about dealing with streaming text processing and very often log processing in the cloud and elsewhere. So at its core, FluentD can be set up to take in multiple streams of text, read those streams as they come in, process them internally, and spit them out into other places, to clouds, to files, to other integrations. It really kind of exists as this integration and glue layer between your data sources and where you might want to put that data. All of this makes FluentD a really great place to handle logs from Kubernetes. So we've got Kubernetes, we've got our workloads running, and those workloads are all generating log data, which is text data. And they're generating that all the time and coming and going. And very often FluentD is the engine behind most of the Prometheus, or sorry, most of the Kubernetes installations that you run, where it's reading those logs as they're generated, reformatting them and sending them to some cloud integration. So that even though you've got a containers running across many, many backend machines, you can view all their logs in one place thanks to the aggregation and export and manipulation provided by something like FluentD. So whether you're using FluentD and don't know it because it's in Kubernetes, or you're interested in doing log processing directly with FluentD, you should check it out. Next is Vitesse. Vitesse is all about dealing with relational databases in the cloud. So it's easy, easy, easy to run a relational database in the cloud or in Kubernetes. But the problem with these databases is that they tend to have to scale vertically. And that is really vulnerable and brittle in the cloud because we don't want things to scale vertically. We want to scale horizontally. We want to be fault tolerant and distributed. So we want to split that big horizontal or vertically scaled database into multiple smaller databases. And Vitesse exists to help us do that. Vitesse is a layer that runs on top of the MySQL 
or Maria DB engine that you already know and trust, but allows for powerful features like replication and sharding. And you can actually increase replicas and reshard and do all sorts of database manipulation using Vitesse while, all while just using the standard MySQL engine. Vitesse also has a proxy process that you can run that allows you to take in SQL or gRPC traffic and distribute it to these kind of more dynamic, sharded, replicated, changing database instances. All this allows Vitesse to be a really great solution for running relational databases in Kubernetes. It allows you to scale and distribute and be fault tolerant, all while still using the kind of database interface that you know and trust. So that's Vitesse. Next is Titanium or TyKV. TyKV is a key value store, so it's all about dealing with key values. So it does the things you might expect from a key value store. It does adds, it does updates, it does deletes. But the cool thing about TyKV is that it scales horizontally, like Vitesse, it scales horizontally very, very well. In fact, according to the Vitesse page, they say that it scales up to petabytes worth of key value data. That's a huge scale. Another really great thing about TyKV is that it supports distributed ACID compliant transactions. So you into a TyKV installation, you can say, I want you to update this key, delete these three keys, change those two keys, and I want you to do all of those operations at once or not at all. That ensures that if you're doing multiple key operations in your key value store, you don't have to get stuck in a halfway state where one, one operation worked and the other failed and you don't know how to recover. So if you're interested in really high scale key value store or transactional key value store, check out TyKV. etcd is also a key value store that's cloud native. So it does all the same things that I've just described, add, updates, deletes. But uh, etcd, rather than focusing on sheer scale, has focused on simplicity. So it's very, very easy to get up and going with an etcd installation or an etcd cluster. It's often just a few commands or a single uh, file away from having a fully functional etcd cluster. Um, so it has all the things you might expect, leader election, fault tolerance, distributed load, uh, but it's much, much simpler to run than some of the other offerings. In fact, the kind of combination of features and simplicity have made etcd the go-to backend for the Kubernetes API for a long time. For a while, it was the only backend. There are a few others now, but odds are really good that if you're using Kubernetes, you're probably using etcd behind the scenes to store all the data you're sending into the Kubernetes API. But you can absolutely use etcd directly for yourself as a key value store. Next is Dragonfly. Dragonfly is all about peer-to-peer -peer file transmission. So we've got pe multiple peers. They can send files to each other. Dragonfly is agnostic about the file content, but it does have some first-class integrations for images. So Dragonfly has native integrations to deal with image transmission peer-to-peer. -peer. And that's not very interesting, but what's cool about Dragonfly is it's distributed peer-to-peer -peer transmission. So you set up Dragonfly nodes throughout your system, and when anybody wants to download a specific image, rather than having to go out to a single place to download the whole image, they can download parts of that image or parts of any file from the peers that have chunks of that file rather than always having to go out. So if you're curious about a better way to do peer-to-peer -peer file transmission or a better way to do image transmission, check out Dragonfly. Next is cloud events. Cloud events, like you might guess, is all about dealing with event infrastructure in the cloud. So we've got our applications and they have the ability, of course, to we say we decide that we want to do event based infrastructure. One thing we might not agree on is the exact format of our events. We may want to use different structure, different terms, and it makes it really hard to say, well, we all want to do events, but we can't agree on what the events should look like. Cloud events exist to be a series of standards and SDKs for us to work with event based infrastructure and all agree that we're going to use cloud events so that we can very easily and efficiently interop with each other because we all use the same back end event structure. So if you're curious about event based infrastructure, check out cloud events. In that same vein, let's talk about NATS. NATS is at its heart really a message bus. So you have producers and consumers where you can put messages into NATS and get them from other processes. And NATS, of course, can run distributed and deal with lots and lots of producers and consumers. It supports a lot of different event bus systems. So you can do things like uh, pub sub, where you publish a message and multiple subscribers get that message. You can do request reply, where you're send specifically to someone and get a specific answer back. Or you can do topic-based or streaming event processing all using NATS. NATS also scales dynamically and very efficiently. So not only is it fast and flexible and really efficient, but it scales really well, which makes it a great solution for doing event-based infrastructure in Kubernetes. So that's NATS. If you're curious about building an event-based system, check it out. Next is Spiffy or the Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And it's all about, like you might guess, identity. Spiffy is a set of standards and tools for dealing with identity in the cloud. Now, when I say identity, I don't just mean users. I mean identity at the node level, identity at the workload level, 
or identity at processes inside the workload. Spiffy is really about saying, well, let's take identity and go as deep as we need to and be more dynamic and more fluid and more granular if we need to, to help us deal with identity in the cloud. Uh, Spiffy is another case where you probably won't use it directly. You'll probably use the Spire project, which takes all the implementations and standards of Spiffy and builds some tools, the Spire server and the Spire agent, where you can implement some of the Spiffy concepts and get this kind of identity stuff that I've been talking about without having to write your own code. So if you're interested in identity and you want to write your own code, check out Spiffy, or if you want to just leverage the Spiffy concepts, uh, check out Spire. Next is Open Policy Agent. It's all about dealing with policy enforcement. So we feed Open Policy Agent policy documents saying, here's what we do and do not want to allow into a given system. And then as we feed objects into that system, OPA either accepts them or rejects them based on the policy it's been given. I'm being intentionally vague because Open OPA doesn't prescribe a specific thing that it's an enforcer of. OPA has been used to enforce policy for a ton of things. One thing OPA fits really well onto, though, is Kubernetes. OPA can run a, on top of and in front of your Kubernetes API so that you can kind of control what you allow into your Kubernetes cluster and what you don't based on the policy that you give OPA. So if you're interested in policy definition or policy enforcement, check out OPA. Last but not least is Falco. Falco is all about container runtime security. So we've got our images and we can use things like Notary to validate that we're running images we trust, but we might still wanna watch these images or these containers or these processes the entire time they're running. So Falco does that. Falco exists to run in our infrastructure and watch our processes all the time. And it has a set of internal rules that says what it expects them to do and what it expects them not to do. And if any of our processes does something we don't expect, like accessing a database we didn't expect it to reach, Falco can see that and send an alert when it happens. So you get always on active security for your workloads. So if you're curious about that, check out Falco. So that's it. I have covered all of the projects in this amount of time. Hopefully you kind of wet, uh, kind of wet your appetite for a lot of these, giving you a basic idea of what each of these projects does and how they fit together. So you can kind of go forth and learn more about them as you see fit. One last thanks to Fippy.io for these great characters. I absolutely love them. Uh, I use Inkscape to create my presentations, Sozy to animate the presentations, and Open Clip Art to get art when I can't draw things myself. Uh, and that's it. Again, my name is Carson Anderson. I work for Weave, not that Weave. You can find out what we do at getweave.com. You can follow me at Twitter at Carson underscore ops and on GitHub at Carsonoid. Thank you so much for all your time, and uh, I hope to see you again soon.